Ladies and gentlemen, I really enjoy this second part. If you liked the first part, you're really going to enjoy the second part if you're anything like me. We're going to delve into a lot of different topics, catching the New Testament authors, adding things that weren't there, obviously t- piggybacking off of the Septuagint. We're also going to look at who the historical Jesus is. Not necessarily who he was, but that there may have been one. Arguments from embarrassment, which delve into interesting details the Gospels maybe don't mean to put there, as you find out. Paul's version of the resurrection being explained over against the Gospels, which is an evolved idea of the resurrection... And Rabbi Tovia Singer takes us down a variety of different offshoots and ideas as we explore these together. I'm interested in doing follow-up shows, and I want your contribution, your comments, your love and support as usual. If you guys like this, like this video, subscribe to the channel. Be sure to go check out his YouTube video and his books. And his YouTube channels are loaded uh, with information. He does come from a believing perspective, but sometimes it's needed to pick someone from a position who firmly believes in their text to really have ammunition against another version of a belief system that may be monotheistically piggybacking off of Judaism or a form of Judaism. I want your thoughts, because I really enjoyed this show, and I plan on doing more. Your host, Derek Lambert. And don't forget, we are Myth Vision. Rabbi Tovia Singer, here we go. Let me let let's change shift topics here because we were talking about the Septuagint. We did rabbit trail into the dogs, um, but I I wanted to ask you, other than the part where they pierced my hands and my feet, the Septuagint has, or we'll just start using Septuagint Christian version just to get people an idea of where we're where we're going with this. What are the differences between what we see with the the Hebrew Masoretic text, as they call it? And, and pretty much what the Hebrew Bible we have now and the Septuagint Bible version, the Christian version, what can you give us another interesting, aha, we caught you. We see the, the finger, we have your DNA, we have your fingerprints, you're red-handed trying to change something, and this is easy to prove that the Christians did with the Septuagint over against the Hebrew version to try and fit their version of Scripture. Do you have somewhere that kind of catches them doing that? It really would be easy to answer the question you ask me if there's a place where they don't do that. Oh. I don't, I'm not trying to be cute here, but right. it's this This is a nightmare, and I don't think people realize. This is why I care so much about Christians is because I know how much trouble they're in. I could, we could go for hours. There are over 200 quotes, it, uh, supposed quotes, right. of the Jewish Bible in the Christian Bible, I means the Christian Bible somehow quotes the Jewish Bible. It, almost all of them are a scam from, not all, but almost all of them are a scam. Unless they're just here, oh Israel, Lord is my God, Lord is one, and that's the most important right. thing, that's fine. But any kind of polemic, it's, 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 it's all playing hide the ball. Um, Can you give like, an example of like Paul? Oh, sure. Because I know Paul I'll does give, it a lot. I'll, oh, Paul, shush. I couldn't, even know where to start. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to get caught. I want to, let me, I'll do okay, Paul. Do what you want. Example. I want to do something because it's my show, not yours. Oh, no, it isn't. It's your show. I'm kidding. No, no, no. Anyway, Please do because us. you're the one who's bringing this and, and I get okay. it. We can do follow up shows where we actually have the ones we want to deal with. This is very interesting. Okay. I want you, the viewer, listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Yeah. The Messiah is described in the Jewish Bible in quite a few places. This is going to come as a shock to everyone. And those places, all Christians know, are talking about the Messiah. 
As it turns out, he's never said to to die, suffer, all that is Christian, all that's layer. No one expects the Messiah to die. We even see it in the book of in the Christian Bible, where when Jesus, we are told, says, I have to suffer and die, Peter goes, Far be it from you. Like, why is Peter so surprised if that's what you're supposed to be doing? Okay, now Good there's point. nothing in the Jewish Bible that says the Messiah is supposed to do any miracles, heal anybody. None of that stuff is in is in the Jewish Bible. There's only one thing we're told in the Jewish Bible, and that is the Mashiach, please God, he'll come soon. He's going to be a teacher who's going to inspire people to turn back to God. The nations are going to repent of his soul. Very famously, he'll rebuke many nations. Now, it may be, please God, the Messiah will come quickly in our time, that he will do miracles. But you could be sure of one thing. This is not important to the Jewish Bible. There is not a single mention anywhere in the Hebrew Bible that the Messiah himself is to do any miracles, let alone what we find in the Christian Bible is walking around, healing bl blind people and, and, and putting spit in, and, and taking devils and casting out devils. There's nothing remotely like this. This is a little troubling to the writers of the Christian Bible. Why? Because they need the Jewish Bible to say that the Messiah is going to heal people. Because the Gospels are just Jesus walking around just healing people. I, I'm not going to, I was going to go, you know, the Messiah's supposed to go around. It's almost like the Messiah's going out, like David Copperfield, like pick right. a car. Like, that's nothing like what the Messiah's well, supposed to do. Well, we see elements of him, like the spittle. That's borrowed from Vespasian, in my opinion. And the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. I didn't even want to get into that. We right. know that. Josephus tells it that 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 Vespasian, the emperor of Rome, who was emperor during the time of the destruction of the Second Temple, he would use the spittle in order to heal the blind. He would touch someone's leg and cripples would walk away. This was standard fare in the Greco-Roman world, that the gods, the lower tier gods of the Greco-Roman world were able to heal people. And that was just standard stuff. Right, that's where it all comes from. But, but what I want to do is show you what was done. Okay. This is going to blow your mind out the window. So okay. what happens is I want to just, just your mind is going to go flying. So I'm going to take something so innocent. I want to direct you. I don't know if you have a Bible near you or not. I don't. I can pull go, it up. It, it's up to you. If you want, you could do it. Follow along. Go to Ma Luke 4, verse 16. Okay. Here's the story. The story goes like this. Jesus goes he, Jesus goes and he goes into a synagogue in Nazareth and it was on the Sabbath day okay and in just so people know in a synagogue on Shabbat on the Sabbath we first will read a portion of the Torah the five books of Moses we do this in a way so that by the end of the year we've gone through the entire Five books of Moses, and it's a, it's a cycle. Okay, good. But we also, in addition to that, read a small portion of the prophets, of the prophets, okay? And a great deal of it's from the book of Isaiah. We are told in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus called up to be the reader in the synagogue to read from the prophets for the whole congregation. Right. And he begins to read, and this you'll find in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he then begins to read from the prophets, and what he's reading from is Isaiah chapter 61. You don't need to take my word for it. If you have any Christian study Bible, there'll be a footnote there telling you that this he's reading from Isaiah 61. This is totally legit because Isaiah 61 could be read in a, in a synagogue on the Sabbath. What happens is the text, he, this is what he reads. This is straight out of the book of Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. That's fine. Now, Isaiah is really speaking the first person about himself. But let's just ignore all that. Continue. He sent me to proclaim liberty to captives. Fine. And recovery of sight to the blind. Huh? <laughs> Recovery of sight to the blind. Now, all you have to do, so you know, I didn't sneak into your house. Right. And you just 
open it either if you're doing this on a browser, you've got a Bible, open up Isaiah 61. Okay. And you'll find that that thing of healing the blind isn't there. Okay, he says uh, the spirit of the, now. This is obviously probably based. It's ESV, so I don't know if this is based off. Makes which no re- difference. The Makes spirit no of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim. Li- whoa, whoa! To proclaim What's liberty. Okay, somehow he went to from healing the blind in the New Testament to he's saying no, to bind healing up the, the blind in Isaiah sixty-one. None of that. It ain't there, right? Bingo, got it. Now, okay. why does Luke <laughs> inter inter the, the word here? Here's our fans interpolate. Right. He sh- now, in, I'm going to tell you this: if you're not studying this stuff and not looking it up. You're never going to know this because this is so getting in under the radar. It's a card trick. It's totally. This is really dealing from the bottom of the deck. That means you just you just threw in because it all sounds good. I'm going to claim the good news. That's the New Testament. That's what the word gospel means. Good news. It's all going good, but it they just shoved it in, just smoked that one in, like you slid it in under the radar. But it isn't in the original. I mean, and why did Luke do it? Because Luke wants to portray Jesus as a healer of the blind, which is the biggest miracle that's that that he's performing. Well, guess what? It's not, of course, in the Hebrew. We have the Dead right. Sea Scrolls that are much older than Christianity, hundreds of years that we have. In the, it ain't there. So, but what this guy, what the Septuagint guys did was they put it in the Septuagint, meaning. You're not going to believe this. You won't believe this is going to blow your mind out the window. (laughs) This is so much more important than Paul. Okay, okay. What? This is the key. So what the author of Luke did, or maybe some scribe who re-edited Luke. Whatever our oldest Luke has this in. There's no Luke that doesn't have it. The key is what someone did was we need to have something that sounds more Christy. We need something that sounds more Jesus-like. That means just give captives, what is that? And when the Jesus free cap, we need him to be a, a healer of the blind. So it's not in Isaiah. So the, the Christian, the church, interpolated that into the book of Luke. It's a cute little story. But he just shoved it in there, but it isn't in the original text. And that's why your King James, NIV, ESV, doesn't have it in Isaiah, which is the source for this. Now, here's this is a this is why this is such a mind blower. If you open up a Septuagint, now you, you might say to yourself, hey, I'm watching this show and I don't speak or read Greek. You don't need to. Why? Because they have the English translation of the Septuagint. It's available. It was translated. That means the Greek Septuagint has been translated into English language by a lot of people. It's often called the LXE. There are many of them. So all you do is, you, you unless if you have the software, it's easy. If you right. don't, just open a browser and, and just Google English translation of the LXX, of the Septuagint. If you do that, but you've got to be like, like sitting down in your chair, really comfortable center of gravity <laughs> and you go to Isaiah 61 there it is it that says sight it come, provide sight to the blind oh my gosh that means Septuagint guys shoved in the interpolation the corruption of Luke now that I'm going to go further okay okay so and by the way, everything I'm saying to you, this is, you know, people, I have a theory. I have a theory that UFOs landed on the Temple Mount. Right. Everything I'm telling you, you can look it up. Right. All, you know, in everything I teach, I say, please, please look it up. I didn't sneak into your computer and shove that in there. <laughs> so, like, I'm just like, so I wanted to show you explicitly that this is a, this is a con job. Yeah. Now, again, you're a pastor. Again, I'm not saying this because I don't want, you know, some pastor to be angry. They don't, they really, don't know. They don't really. Nick, if you show this to your pastor, he's going to just lose his toupee on this. Right. It's because he, you know what? 
he never saw before. Now, if you go into the Christian comment, this is this is the now you want to go. We're going more insane. Okay, okay. We're gonna go crazier now. Let's okay, do you ready? It. You ready? I'm, I'm always going crazy. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Now, yeah, you're not. You won't believe what I'm about to say because okay. I've loaded this up. Now here we go. <laughs> now, I'm not the first guy who noticed this. Christian apologists noticed this problem as well. Like, they notice that the text appears in Luke with re- providing recovery of sight to the blind, but it's absent from Isaiah 61. I'm not like some guy in Jerusalem who just invents this stuff right. or discovers it because I'm Mr. Einstein of the Bible. People have discovered this. But here's the crazy thing. If you go to any any commentary on the Bible— that means, let's say you have some study Bible, whoever, it doesn't make a difference whose study Bible you have. So you know what a study Bible is. Oh, you yeah. have the text on the top, the bottom has got the commentary. So many of them, not all, many of them address this. And they say that Luke 4.18 is a quote of the Septuagint, not of the Hebrew. Right. Well, but the, you know what's insane about that? The story says the opposite. The original story is that Jesus walks into a synagogue uh, in Nazareth, and he's reading from the scroll. He's oh. not reading from a Septuagint. This is the whole hammer lock on what wow. a scam this is. The t- means if you go back to Luke and say, okay, I'm just going to read Luke. For what it That's says. Like, I, like, just read it. That's what the deal. You see, uh-huh. what I'm... Everything I'm sharing with you and the viewers, this is not like I have a theory. Who cares what my theory is? I'm saying just open the text and, and see what's it. going on. Open your commentary. I don't care who you use as your commentary. Pick it. That's what they're going to say. They're going to he say is that reading the Hebrew like, according to what the I, narrative is saying, yet the commentator right, is saying – this is quoting the Septuagint, which is like, what the heck? What the heck are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. And Jesus, the Son of God, you have, I mean, this is, imagine this, the Son of God, <laughs> I mean, he's the second person of the Trinity, walks into a synagogue on the Sabbath in northern part of Israel, and he's going, uh, does anybody have a Greek translation <laughs> because my Hebrew really is not very good? That wow. is insanity. And it says little he's reading from the scroll. It means he's not reading from a Septuagint. So the commentary that has to rescue, I mean, this story is so insane that if I couldn't show this to you in black and white for yourself, maybe you might have trouble believing this. But So that's why I could sit here for days and days. I mean, I, just so people know, if, if you, I do have a very, very large YouTube channel, and I, I'm saying this not to plug my channel. Channel has a, is 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 huge. A lot of viewers, twenty six thousand. The key is this: if you go to YouTube, and if you have a question about any verse or any concept, you can. Uh, we're have Derek and I are having a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I know. Oh, we I love this. this we're doing it. We're having a blast. But the truth is, if you have a question about a verse, you could just search my name in YouTube and the verse, and I'll, I probably because like seven hundred videos, so you just can go for it. That the key is you. What I'm showing you is not my opinion. It's it, it's that's what the text says. So what well, what we're looking at is something really really quite scandalous. And who are the victims? The victims are the Christians, people in the church who really for the most part, are nice people, I assume, Mm -hmm. I'm sure. There are a few crazies, yeah, Yeah. everybody's got nut jobs. But the most people are very (laughs) sincere people. America's a very religious country. And if you're not sure of that, go to Europe. You'll see the churches are empty. The United States is a very religious country filled with predominantly Christians and predominantly Protestant Christians who pride themselves they read the Bible. They're just not reading Hebrew. Virtually no Christian reads his or her Bible in Hebrew. They're all using translations. Right. It, and this this has been a nightmare for the church. It's been it's ultimately the nightmare for the parishioner because if you're reading a translation, you're reading a human iteration. Translation is a man made product. Go to the original Hebrew. And Hebrew is a really easy language to learn. That, I, I wanted to ask something something if you don't mind. I I, I no. uh, 
I'm bringing up a topic that was recently discussed on my last show, and this is kind of in the same vein. I, I, I see the gospel narratives as, <clears throat> as mythology. Yes, they're theological, but I do think there's a huge... Uh, invention here of this story. This story is obviously concocted. It seems like it's not really historical. In my opinion, it's historical fiction at best. And what I'm, what I wanted to ask your opinion was, and I don't know if you delved into this too much, but I think Josephus and his writings play a huge part on the development, or at least they go hand in hand with the gospel narratives in a lot of ways. And I'll give you an example. Jesus being crucified between two thieves. I can find similar narratives in, in, in other stories and even in the Hebrew uh, Bible in Joseph's story, for example, with the two men who dream in the dungeon who are down there. You could see some type of try to make it look similar. But in Josephus' autobiography, he had three friends that were crucified. And one of them comes down and survives. I feel... I feel like they, they hijacked that and used this stuff into this narrative. But my biggest red flag and why I'm hesitant to just wholeheartedly accept that idea is you've got these other characters, what, what appears to me like Paul and others who really believe this guy was really crucified, it seems. Um, and they actually believe that he was the Messiah. And actually, is it cognitive dissonance or is this like fabricated is this like was there really people who thought that this guy really came and he really died got killed and they somehow really thought he rose again were they going crazy or do you think it was all made up maybe yeah so actually this isn't difficult to answer at all first our story in josephus josephus story is very interesting right. and most people miss why this is so interesting so josephus is a very well connected person right he's he's working on behalf of the romans he's writing for the roman empire Okay. Jewish guy, he's writing for Roman. He's the most important first century historian. Now, what would Jerusalem look like in the first century? Okay, Josephus was born in 37, dies about 100. What, what, is, what would it look like to walk down the streets of Jerusalem in the 60s when there's a war, in the 50s? What would it look like? You would see something horrendous. The estimates are about a quarter of a million Jews were crucified in the first century. That means that crucifixion, which was the really one of the most horrific ways that anyone concocted to kill anyone, was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. It was a banality. That means what and this is what you witness. You witness people on a cross or usually a stake, naked, and here's the key about you have to understand about Jerusalem. Nine out of twelve ones weather is perfect. Jerusalem is on a mountain, not really high, but it's about 3,000 feet above sea level. If I tell you that the weather in Jerusalem, eight and a half, certainly eight and a half months of the year, is somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees with no humidity. Okay, So Jerusalem has just amazing weather. And that, let alone the winter, where you have a lot of nice... Jerusalem has, like the like think of the United States and think of like where you just have great weather, maybe South Carolina, I don't know. But, you know, like Miami is too hot. So imagine a place that's also a, what happened. So all these people are crucified. They're left there naked and they they die of eventually they just can't stand any longer and they their legs let go and it takes them many days usually a healthy adult could stand for many many days they're defecating on themselves it's horrible and finally they give out their legs give out they collapse their lungs become elongated and they die of asphyxiation it's horrible and then they're just their bodies are left for scavengers to eat and so you don't even have a decent burial it's just a, it's just the word and so imagine now here why did the romans do that that's a very expensive thing we know that lumber was brought into israel so that uh because they didn't have enough wood why would the romans go to the expense of putting people up on stakes high high up and that's what you saw naked, dying people screaming, crying all over Jerusalem. Why? Because these people would have committed one offense to get crucified. 
And that is that they conspired against the empire. If you were a threat to the empire, they wanted to make an example out of you. And when you saw that, when you saw hundreds of people just dying, imagine the humiliation, the horror, the nightmare. And because Jerusalem is such, has such great weather, people just didn't die of, of, of heat cold exhaustion. or heat stroke. Yeah. No. I mean, you're, it's 72 degrees outside. <sighs> it's perfect weather. So you really will last for that. What happens to Josephus? Josephus is walking around Jerusalem, and he sees his buddies. He knows them, and they're still alive because people lasted for days. I mean, the story, like in John, where Jesus is dead in six hours, is extremely unlikely. Right. I mean, when I say extreme unlikely, now, is it possible that someone could drop dead in six hours? I guess it's possible. For sure it's possible. It's just very... It would be very unlikely. And that's the real takeaway. People just didn't die. If I told you, if I, um, usually nails weren't used. It's controversial what we use. But if your hands were bound to a thing and you're standing on something, you could stand for more than six hours. You could stand for more than 24 hours. Whatever it is, eventually he gave out and died. That's the takeaway. The takeaway is people just, the story, in that sense, the story is concocted. But, Therefore, if Jesus was crucified, anyone was crucified because the empire was trying to make an example out of you. If you just went over to someone and said, you know, give me your money or I'll kill you, and the guy doesn't give you money and you kill the guy, they just take you and kill you. The Roman Empire is not going to spend a fortune on having you crucified because that's not the threat they're concerned about. They're, the Roman Empire was only concerned about any threat to the empire and crucifixion sent the message. That's what happens to you if you mess with the empire. And therefore, Josephus's description of crucifixion is something that everybody was aware of. That means, that means that's what you saw. And right. the writers of the New Testament were very well aware of what the Romans had in in store for you if you were a, if you were a threat to the empire. In fact, our Josephus's mention of Jesus, so-called mention of Jesus in antiquities, um, eighteen, for example, three three, that's all nonsense. That was added in much much later. Those are not authentic to Josephus. They were interpolated later. What, what in fact, was it know, specifically? It's called Testimonium Flavium. Okay, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Antiquities of the Jews. Yeah. Uh, Book 18, Section 3, Paragraph 3. Interpolated. Where it goes to, it's a, that. He would never have said that. Never. I mean. That's not how we know. Right. The way we know, okay, okay, he would never say that's true. Because he wasn't a Christian, he wouldn't have said that. Moreover, the early manuscripts don't have him saying that much. He does, it like grows and grows. (laughs) The way we know for sure that that's an interpolation is that no one mentions it until the 4th century, until Eusebius. No one. And people knew Josephus. Origen knew Josephus. Jerome knew Josephus. And they never mentioned it. Zero. (sighs) We know who invented it. They were apologists. They would have used it as their evidence. Yeah, I hear Ah, you. you That was a big argument. Origen writes a whole work that survives in 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 an apologetic work against pagans who said, Jesus... They would, of course, appeal to it. What survives from Jerome's work, not a lot, but his, um, but his defense of, of Christianity, uh, he would have, of course, quoted it. He never quoted it. We have 14 church fathers whose writings survive who live prior to Eusebius, meaning live prior to the 4th four, century, prior to Constantine. Nobody mm-hmm. quotes it. Nobody quotes it because it didn't exist. At the time of Eusebius, that's where it enters into his histories. So he quotes it. So that's he's not quoting. It's manufactured. Now, whether Eusebius, the historian of Christianity, just invented it or his next door neighbor did this, I can't tell you. Nobody, right. nobody can answer that. The, the, but now, it's the, obvious that someone would have case, said it. Case, that's how we know. Yeah. It, this is do not write to me that I'm arguing from silence. Right. If, if Josephus wrote, there was a man, if anyone, call him a man who was the Christ, who did many miracles and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, so so you really think that uh, that that Justin would go, nah, I don't think so. I, we're not going to quote that. 
So it's, it's total insanity. What, um, what about so? Je- therefore, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was no, going to no. say Jesus been Ananias, right? So, so uh, I like probing on. And my big thing on Myth Vision is we're trying to figure out who Jesus was, if there was, because there's also the question of. Could this have been an invented character, so to speak, to try and fit this time frame? For example, Jesus ben Ananias, the woe-saying Jesus, right? He runs around, woe to you, Israel, and scribes and Pharisees. And Josephus has, and it's just my opinion, I could be wrong, I'm not a scholar, but just, I've read it a few times, I had it read last time on our show. It sounds very fictional, even coming from Josephus, because... They've got this story where this Jesus character is saying, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And they take him in, the scribes and Pharisees or the scribes and the Sanhedrin. I can't remember what it said, but they flog him. And it says he didn't make a peep. He didn't suffer. He showed no pain. And every time they flogged him, he said, woe to you, Israel. And then they flog him again. Woe to you, such and such. And then they flog him again. And then at the end, they release him because they said he's insane. Well, during the war, a catapult's coming prior to the catapult that hits him, he's running around on the temple wall saying, whoa to Israel, whoa to again. And this catapult comes and last but not least, the story says, he said at his last, last thing he said was, and woe to me. And then the catapult hits him and, and so this narrative of woe, the woe saying Jesus, I think was taken from Josephus and used in the mouthpiece of this Jesus character in the Gospels to be saying, woe to you, Israel, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, etc., etc. The only thing missing is he doesn't say woe to me. And he says, hey, don't weep for me, weep for your children's children. We know that's talking about the temple, and it's a supposed... Yeah, but that's only Luke's narrative. In Mark's narrative, we have a different... Only Luke... Okay. Uh, passion narrative has Jesus saying that to the weeping women, weep for yourself, don't weep for me. Right. Uh, what do so, you think, right. though? Do you think all right, that... so here's what we have to do there. Okay. okay. So we're dealing with literature from the ancient world, okay? And the question is, what's your methodology? So we're looking at a text. You said this correctly. It's just loaded with myth, front loaded with myth. But the question is, is there anything historical in this myth? Right. And it, you, often there is just a, something historical, and then there's this loaded with, with nonsense, like the Mormon church, like Joseph Smith. There's a little <laughs> truth that the guy was in the, New York State, whatever. There's just <laughs> all right. So the question here's the deal: you need a methodology. Can we use a methodology to figure out is there anything historical in in the text, uh, and what is your methodology, and is it rigorous? It better be rigorous because I'm not a Christian, but I I might want to know. Now I just want to say this up front: this is n- not my issue as a rabbi, because. I address the question, is Jesus the promised Messiah or not? Right. If he's not, it doesn't make a difference. He was a plumber. Now, but I will tell you there are there are methods and some are very rigorous. And one is uh, it's called the criteria of dissimilarity, the criteria of embarrassment. Are there things in the Christian Bible that are really embarrassing? Th- and therefore, it's unlikely someone would have invented that. Okay, All right, so let me let me just so I, uh, that so th- that would then be likely to be authentic. I just a real quick example: Paul, as we find in the Christian Bible, can't get along with anyone. Paul isn't fighting with Jews in the Christian Bible; he's fi- fighting with fellow Christians who he believe have a. F- are preaching a false gospel whose Christology diver- is very different than his. Okay, he's fighting with everybody. He's showing Peter to his faith, Galatians two. Okay, so yeah. Paul won't travel with John Mark. He's, he's being called really, a liar everywhere he goes. And 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 conversely, he's yelling at the people in Galatians chapter three, verse one and two, who bewitch you. You glad. That means who filled your head with the stupidity? He's complaining about other people who came to his church after he set it up, taught them a Christology he disagreed with. He right. hated the Torah. He hated the law. And he's going, now, uh, stop for a minute. Let's stop because I, we need to breathe this in. We need to really make sure this makes a lot of sense. We we, we can't play games. We've got to really use rigorous methodology. Right. How likely is it 
that Paul really got along with everybody. There was, he had no fight with Peter, no fight with Mark. He, and somebody invented these fights that he was having with fellow Christians who were his interlocutors. The answer is about zero. Why? Because it's embarrassing. It, no one would invent that Paul couldn't get along with you. By the way, we all know like, we all know people who just can't get along with people, right. right? It might be a sister-in-law of yours. It might be someone you went to school with, someone down the block. We all know people. It doesn't mean they're stupid. No. They're just people who just can't get along with other people. You know, you're at a party. There are a lot of people. And then that guy or that girl walks into the room. Everyone goes, oh, God, here we go. This is going to be a nightmare. That's right. who Paul was. Paul isn't getting along with anyone. No, you can believe that that whole thing is made up. I'm it's not just, saying that, and, and I don't want to uh, give that vibe because because here I I always keep the question open. Okay, I, I never close the door on it. Though the probability to me, I think that this Paul character who, or whoever he really may have been, um, I think he was connected. In my opinion, based off what I see, I think he's in cahoots with people in power. I think he is on the Roman side. He's protected by the Romans. Left and right, every Could time turn he, he, That's right. We have a, a text in the New Testament that says he was a citizen of Rome. I think unlikely, but it's very possible. So that's right. absolutely could be the case. Certainly. It depends, you know, the depiction Acts versus Paul's own writing versus the pseudepigrapha that we are told to believe Paul wrote, but he would not have written like it was inconceivable he wrote Second Timothy or Ephesians or the Timothy, First Second Timothy. It's almost impossible for, for reasons that are beyond the scope of this whole conversation. Right. So here's, here's where I want to go, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, let's take a city of Nazareth. What are the chances someone would have just made up Nazareth? Well, it's very unlikely because that is never mentioned in Tanakh, not in the Talmud. Josephus never mentions it. It's a little unlikely that someone would have invented that. Here's a, one that's more interesting than that. In Jewish, according to Jewish tradition, he existed. Okay, according to right. our tradition, there was somebody who ultimately rebelled against his rabbi, and it just wasn't a happy affair, and he ultimately becomes a someone who is from, from the Jewish people who just makes the fellow sages his enemy. That's, I'm oversimplifying, but that's that's basically the Jesus deal. Jesus or Paul? No, Jesus. Okay, okay. Okay? Now, there are, I just want to, uh, full disclosure, there's a lot of arguments, is this the same Jesus? But it, most of the consensus is that it is. Okay. Here's, I, I want to get to this very fine point. According to our tradition... Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. There's nowhere, Jesus does not come off well in Jewish, ancient Jewish literature at all. He, it's a nightmare. That means there's nothing good to be said about him. But they never say there's no place in any rabbinic literature anywhere, and there's a lot, that says that he was a false Messiah or a false prophet. It isn't there. Okay? So again, in Jewish tradition, in the Talmud and so on, there's not there is a lot of criticism of him. There are a lot of things that he should have done differently that he didn't do. What is not germane to this? So the Talmud is not a fan of Jesus at right. all. But if Jesus was walking around saying that I'm the Messiah, that would have been um, the Talmud. Well, Jewish literature would have mentioned that he was a false messiah, because that would have been a massive thing to claim that I'm, and by the way, to be sure that this would have been a big deal, in the Christian Bible, we are told that that's the claim Jesus is making that gets him in all this trouble. He's claiming to be the son of man, meaning he's claiming to be the personality of Daniel 7, 13, 14. You know, he's claiming to be the son of the living God. I don't want to get far because we'll get lost. Just stay with me on this. Yeah. The writers of the Christian Bible were very aware of the fact that claiming to be the Messiah when you're not is a really is going to upset people. It's just it's that's really a bad idea. People, that's, that that'll be a really a negative. <laughs> now, the Jewish tradition says he never made that claim, although Jewish tradition does not see him favorably. Right. Okay? Now, 
here's the rub. This is why I think it, there, it is authentic. The book of Mark has to hit you over the head. It's the earliest of the four Gospels. And the book of Mark is a, is a, is a small book. It's 16 chapters. The first eight chapters are very striking because nobody knows who Jesus is. It's the big secret. If anybody figures out, Jesus goes, Shh, don't tell anyone. The key of what we find in the Gospels is that no one knows who the heck Jesus is. And in fact, at the end of the game, Jesus turns around. This is right before the crucifixion and says, who, who is he asking? He's not asking people in Bermuda. He's asking his own disciples, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? And this is after his entire ministry. That means right. we're at the end of the game. The movie is just about over. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he turns to the people who are around him. Now, the length of his ministry differs from the synoptics to one year, John to three years. Makes no difference. They were around him a long time. And nobody knows. That's the key. Are you that prophet? Nobody knows except for Peter. Peter, Matthew 16, it says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus responds that, that flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. The point what we find in the Gospels, and this is most pronounced in Mark, the least embellished Gospel is that no one knows who Jesus is, and no one thinks he's the Messiah. And therefore, what is the likelihood, now listen very carefully, what is the likelihood that Jesus really walked around saying that he's the Messiah, and someone who's writing the Christian Bible, whoever wrote it, wanted people to believe in Jesus, uh, the Messiah. John says, this was written that you might believe. And they thought, no, we'll just make up this, uh, that Jesus, that no one knew who Jesus was. Why? That's very embarrassing. Therefore, the most likely, the best possible explanation is, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Rather, that was the claim made for him after he was By dead. By disciples and, or people that followed him. Well, I can do that story with you. That means okay. we can figure we could tease that out. Right. But again, is, is everything possible? Of course it is. But it's just so un. This is how 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 critical studies are done of ancient texts. Like, how could you figure out what is historical in this text? There are things that are just so embarrassing that no one would have invented. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that are just so embarrassing that it does nothing to bolster your story. It only diminishes from it. And therefore it's more likely, that's all we have, is more likely to be historical. It is more likely that you have some itinerant fellow going around who just has it in with fellow Jews. He develops a small group of people around him, and he's never claiming to be the Messiah. Rather, once he's killed because... Now, here's where you I, I talk about this in my introduction to Isaiah 53 that ultimately the Romans find him threatening in some way. If he, because if he was crucified, he wasn't crucified for molesting children, he was crucified for threatening the empire, right? And and that's the deal, and that's the, that's that is the methodology that historians use that is very rigorous. It's non-speculative. Now, it's true that all the virgin birth stuff, we know that to be embellishments. What you said, Derek, earlier is that is loaded with embellishments. Mm -hmm. How do we know? Uh, maybe because we're not Christians, we're just saying things that are not flattering. We know it because the earliest writings of the New Testament, the letters of Paul, the authentic letters of Paul, indisputed letters, those seven letters, are all written during the 50s. There's not a mention of Jesus being born a virgin. Paul didn't think that was important, important right. enough to mention. Mark, earliest gospel. We're introduced to Jesus as an adult. Mark just didn't think that Jesus' birth, born of a virgin, was important. That's inconceivable. So, yeah, there we see the layers of mythology. And the yeah. way we do that is a different – that the it's inconceivable that Jesus is walking around saying, I and the Father are one, as we're <laughs> told in John chapter 30, uh, John chapter 10, verse 30, 31 – and just Matthew didn't think that was important enough to mention. That's how we can see the layers and layers of embellishment. And where they would have come up with that is exactly what you said. They saw what Josephus would have seen. They saw the scene that everyone's, and it scared people to death. Imagine for a moment living in a world where you saw people dying on crosses, 
body is being eaten by skin. I mean, all you'd be saying to yourself is, I never want that to be me. I, I'll tell you just a fast thing. You know, I remember sometimes in America, I haven't lived in the United States for a while, but they have this show like Cops and or what happens to people living in prison, right? They yeah, have these yeah, shows. Yeah. And you see these people living in lockup, right? Where they they have to be in a cell twenty three hours a day for five they're, years straight in solitary whatever. confinement. You know, what? Let, let's talk, you and me, okay? Yeah. Okay. We're watching that show, okay? Like, and what do we think? We're, like, we're eating popcorn. We're like, I never want that to happen Ever. to me. <laughs> no matter what, I'll do parking tickets. I might speed. But I am not. That is not going to be me. No. So whatever bad idea you might have about doing it, you're going to go, whoa, I do not want to be locked up in a cage <laughs> for 10 years and be raped up and down. God only knows what goes oh, on. Oh, man. God only knows. You're just saying, you know, I mean, me, I made up my mind when those shows came out. I'm going to make sure I have a good account that goes through my taxes. I'm not. I'm. I'm just. I'm just not going to jail. That's just not <laughs> going to be my scene. So now that's just a, a a television. Imagine you see dead people or dying people. The message is clear. Don't mess with the empire. That's what the empire was interested in. The threats of the empire. So that's how people can. You. That's the methodology that I've shared with you, that we use to say. With a fair amount of certainty, this is likely to be historical. And I know this isn't going to be answerable in the full extent. I, I suspect you'll you'll have to speculate, but help me because this is um, this is a mystery to me, Rabbi. If you don't mind me asking, Paul, according to scholars, say he wrote in the fifties. We have the gospel narratives that most say came after Pauline literature, and they kind of piggyback Paul in a lot of ways. Uh, but somewhat not. Uh, some places they do, probably most, but somewhat not. Now, here's my question. If Jesus dies in actual history in the 30s, or maybe around that time when Pontius Pilate was in, in reign, and he reigned for 10 years, I believe, somewhere around there. 12 years, 1237. 12, okay. So how in such short amount of time under Pontius Pilate to Paul— do we have a Christology of a death, burial, resurrection concept being already circulated and believed by him, but not only Pauline type Christians, quote unquote, but other types of Christians that were teaching other types of gospels, which I, I guess, and I might be speculating, I suspect they had a, a belief in Jesus too, because he's arguing supposedly with Peter and James and these guys are going back and forth about this guy who rose from the dead. Like how in I can I can do this whole thing for you if you got the time. It's up to you. Do you want to do this as a part two? I'll I will do this with you because this is very interesting. And I okay. can, just like everything you've asked me, I said, okay, here's our sources and they're So do you want it? I'll do it. We'll do it. I'm, I'm I would have never been able to yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You tell me what you want to do. You want I'm to do following this, you. Can, whatever you're interested you, in. You could turn this in. Well, by the way, you'll edit this part out. You could turn this show into two part one, part two. If you Absolutely. Want. I'm going to have to. Okay? <laughs> you're going to have to. So I'll, I'll answer because we're smoking now and I don't want to stop. This is good. Smoke. So, this is good. So I this love it. By the way, I want to say this too. Um, I really do. I, I feel a connection to you as a brother, and I really appreciate everything you're bringing to the table. Like, you really are teaching me, and I really enjoy this, by the way. I just want to let you know that. It, it is fascinating, and I feel the same way, Derek, But and uh, bless you, and, and really. You. So, all right, let's go back here. So, so I would have never un been able to completely unpack this until I moved to Indonesia. So this is important about my life. I was the rabbi of Indonesia for for five years, okay? okay? I lived in the Far East for five years. We, and, the, and the Far East is really a very different place. I mean, it's not like uh, you're from wherever in the West Coast, so you go to Ohio and then you go to Queens, New York. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's the same. And if you ever go to Australia, it's, it's different, but it's not really. But the Far East is really very different. What happens? I would. It, what happens is that, so Indonesia is famous for many reasons, including it's the largest Muslim country in the world. 
240 million Muslims, okay? As it turns out, its minority Christian community is enormous. Roughly 25 million uh, Christians live in Indonesia, the fourth largest country in the world. Indonesia also, as is the whole Far East, is very religious. I have never met an atheist in Indonesia and if you were, they would look at you like you're out of your mind. It's a super, there's a lot of superstition. But to say I don't believe in God, I never heard of such a thing. And that's just not only true for Indonesia, same thing for Malaya, same thing for the Philippines, Thailand. Everybody's got a religion. It's right. a religious place. Now, I want to talk about the Christians. What happens? So there are many people who are part of my congregation in Indonesia who used to belong to a mega church in Indonesia, and there's quite a number of them. Like in the U.S., there was there are these pastors who are very charismatic, and they could pack in a stadium and have 30,000 people in their church, 40,000 people in their church. They have a guy like that in Houston, right when you come out of the airport, I forget his prosperity preachers, you got all these guys. They, they're mega church pastors. Indonesia had one guy. Now, I don't recall his real name, but he was called Peter the Great. Okay, hmm. he, he was a very charismatic guy. I don't know the numbers, so I'm going to... It, but it's something on the order of... He had 30,000, 40,000 people in his church. Okay. He was the hottest thing. They were just packing stadiums for this guy. He was huge. And he was a prosperity preacher, like Joel Olstein, but much worse. People would give them all their money, their gold. And I had Jewish people who got involved in these churches who later regretted, I gave this guy so much money, I threw away. And these guys, of course, lived like kings. You know the whole deal. They're all over the United States, these prosperity preachers. Give me all your money. It's a whole thing. Is a, so that's what this guy was. This guy, he had some Indonesian name. Even I knew it, but it, I wouldn't even know how to pronounce it. But the key is, he's he's this good looking. You know, he's this great, polished. Just really, has got his act together. He would be there on stage in a stadium with thirty, forty thousand people. The place is going nuts. He's promised them promising them he's going to take them to Jerusalem and we I'm going to bring Jesus second coming the whole oh, thing gosh. the whole thing what happens what happens check this out so this is the biggest guy in the whole scene I think he was 48 something like that it means he's not an old guy he suddenly has a massive heart attack and drops dead he just has just he just drops dead like that. So he went from promising he's taking Indonesian Christians to Jerusalem with this whole future and give me your money. And he's the people, you know, he has prayer, the whole thing. You see it all over America. And the guy just drops dead. And he's not that old. He's, I, I, I remember something like being in his late 40s. What happens? The place goes nuts. His funeral was unbelievable. His grave is like, I don't know what, is made to look like Jerusalem. The key is this. Within days of his burial, people just can't, his followers can't wrap their brains around this. Immediately, all these women, and this, by the way, what you're about to hear is totally politically incorrect. And if you are offended, do not watch the show now. Watch I Love Lucy. This is not for you, okay? This is just what happened, so I'm going to say it. The facts. And, and just don't do what you want, okay? But this is just, this like blew my mind away. Suddenly, it happens within days of his burial that women are saying that Peter the Great appeared to them all over the place. He came to me. The only problem is what he said he's going to do. Everyone's disagreeing about it. But the point is, it happened to me. I'm going, wow. That means the guy just died, and he's appearing. He's having pancakes with people in Java. You know, he's meeting these ladies, and he's meeting them, and they're encountering the resurrected Peter the Great, some deal like that. Now, Indonesia is right next door to the Philippines, which is a Catholic country. There are women there that are meeting the Virgin Mary every day for lunch. Right. 
it's a big deal. Now, I'm going to say this. I, I'm not trying to be provocative, <laughs> but let's live in the real world. Right. I've never done a study of this. This is all anecdotal, but almost all of them are women. Okay. I don't hear many guys saying the Virgin Mary came to me. Maybe they are, and I'm just not hearing about it, but it's basically women and kids. Look at lords. Look at all of that. Right. Yeah, whatever it is, God made women a little different. I don't know what it is. I haven't studied it, but I know what I see. This is all anecdotal, but it's everywhere. And if you're watching this show, you know. So what I saw was, oh, it, people are most traumatized at the burial. I don't know if you've ever been to a burial, but... Watching a burial is very traumatic. It's because it becomes real, okay? And then immediately afterwards, people are having visions of him all over, and they're usually, actually, I don't even remember one story of a guy who met him. Only women. Not I'm saying there aren't. I didn't study it. It just, that's what I saw all over the place. He's meeting everybody in a post. He's re resurrecting in some spiritual way, coming to visiting people all over the place. And I'm going, wow, not only didn't take long, the closer you were to the death, the more likely is you're going to find people running around saying that he met me. We have the same story of a guy in India who was enormously popular. His name is Sai Sai Baba, who had... 11 million followers resurrected the dead in front of stadiums of people, but healed blind people. <laughs> Sai Baba, look him up. He just died just a couple years ago. Okay. There are people around. He has 30 million followers today. They're all claiming he's visiting them day and night. This is the thing. He resurrected dead people, healed blind people in front of million, thousands of people, millions on television, and you can watch a YouTube videos. They're all over the place. You don't need the New Testament for this. Right. So, so here, so number one, you don't need, it's not like you need a progression of a lot of time for when someone's favorite rabbi, spiritual leader, whatever, dies, where the story develops slowly. It's right. just the opposite. It's the trauma of the immediacy that sparks. People just don't know how to process it. Is he dead? That means it's over. I'll never see him again. And that means everything. Or is this thing going to now continue on in a new spiritual body? 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. Right. So that's stage one. So people get caught up. Well, how could it take it so long? Paul, after all, became a Christian just a few years after I the crucifixion. Yeah. It's just the opposite. The closer you are, the more likely it is you can probably be running around. What happened to our guy from the Galilee? Now, now stage two. We got to. Okay. We got to. Okay. Let's fit. This I together. wanted to Go say on. one thing on that note, though. They, they they did a. There is a. I can't remember, and I I probably butchering this. Maybe our audience who's watching can comment down below. Um, they're they've done some type of research, and they actually have a statistic on people who experience their loved one in some way after they died, like what you're talking about. I suspect there's some science behind why we experience these things, but nonetheless, uh, regardless, uh, they, they say like a good percentage of people regardless have that 15, experience. 15% of healthy people see either a loved one or a religious figure appear to them in some way that's that's right and you know i've dreamt my favorite person in the world is my grandmother of blessed memory i've had quite a few times where i dreamt where she's communicating she's not communicating she's dead right it's I a dream understand. right but she was so important to my life that there are just it's sort of like a movie in my mind that plays when i was sleeping i mean I can understand. The, the numbers must be higher. Now, I didn't wake up and go, my grandmother was there. I got it. Some people sort of, the, the, the line is thing. So do this you, is really simple. Do you fall simple, into that healthy simple. category? No, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> no, not at all. No, I, I, am, I am a schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> and somebody, for whatever reason, decided to put a chip into my head. Yeah. And the CIA is following everything I'm doing, even though I'm in Israel. Get him, get him. That said, here's, here's the other half. That means who's behind this? Right. 